Okay, so my name is Joel Savitz, and I will be presenting on the kernel development learning pipeline. So just give a brief introduction, uh, show a quick video, and then just dive into the discussion because it's a off, right? So should be a um, minimal amount of just talk. So, all right. So first of all, uh, what is this thing? Uh, so if you're not familiar, KDLP, right? First of all, it's a Red Hat sponsored open source project. There's lots of those. So this is another one. Uh, it is an attempt to address the documentation problem uh, in the Linux kernel or in the Linux community, uh, which is, you know, pretty, pretty well known and difficult problem. And it is a smooth on-ramp for getting new kernel engineers into the community and getting them started with doing kernel development. So what do we do? Just very briefly, we publish all of our course materials as a freely available resource on our website, um, basically as they become available. Uh, we design and deliver a four-credit university course uh, called Introduction to Linux Kernel Development. Right now, it is delivered at um, UMass Lowell, both in the fall and spring semesters. We've done it a couple of times, uh, and we are hoping to bring it to a couple of other places, but um, I'm not going to make any promises on this recorded line until that is a thing. Uh, and, of course, we want to recruit the best and brightest as interns, um, which we do, and we have done, and you know, funding permitting, we hope to continue to do. Finally, uh, we improve on our curriculum using real student feedback because um, we have this body of students, which is somewhat of a rep representative sample of the kind of people uh, who, like, they have the software engineering background uh, to learn kernel engineering, but, um, you know, they don't necessarily have um, the particular kernel engineering skills. So, um, you know, we we're able to figure out how to meet students where they are and provide content that actually um, is accessible to people who haven't been working, you know, uh, on the Linux kernel for a company or something like that. So, all right, without further ado, um, you know, I can talk about it, say a bunch of words, but I think the best thing is to just jump into a video from some of the people who um, have been involved in this program. So let me just... Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah. I am Connor Kamen. My name is Jake Carenti. My name's Heidi Dempsey. Hey, I'm Michael Burke. My name is Dennis. My name is Moisegua Guma, also known as Thomas. I'm an intern at Red Hat. I'm currently a senior at UMass Lowell studying computer science, and I'm also a associate software engineer here at Red Hat. I work in the research group at Red Hat in the CTO office. I'm a former student of the KDLP program. I am a computer science student at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I was recruited by Microsoft, which is currently where I'm working on the Azure Cloud team. I've been contributing to the KDLP project wherever I can, consuming the content just as much as I've been contributing. Though I've certainly found it very challenging at times, I've also found it extremely rewarding. Uh, it teaches you computer science topics that are relevant to industry right now, which is definitely something you can't say about a college curriculum all the time. I think that KDLP is maybe the only class I took in college where I felt that the instructors genuinely cared about getting students ready for not only real jobs in the real world, but also getting students ready to contribute to the world of free and open source software. It's always been a group of engineers and students working together. I'm proud to be a part of it. And I would like to thank Joel and Heidi for organizing it and putting it together. I think it's a very uh, helpful project for a lot of students. I really love the course and I really love the KDLP program. And I think that Joel and Charlie are really good teachers and they have put in a lot of work and, and it shows. Um, love to see some plumbers joining us here. Thanks a lot. Bye. So uh, we had this idea that uh, we could just have a bunch of people just like join the thing, uh, like join this session in some kind of like video conference thing. But even if like the technical details of that worked out, uh, it probably would have been, you know, pretty awkward and weird. So uh, like I, I had this this idea that I could just like call someone on the phone and be like, oh, how was your experience? But um, on short notice, we decided to just uh, reach out and get clips. And then so um, Joseph Brody, who uh, is our creative director, put this thing together pretty much over the weekend. So a uh, big thank you to him. All right. So what are we doing right now? Uh, we are currently teaching a semester of the course, uh, fall semester at uh, UMass Lowell, University of Massachusetts Lowell. 
right? And um, that's just, I think I'm sharing the tab, so this won't work, but I will show this, um, you know, once we get to the discussion. Um, actually, the class is currently going on right now. Like, it's the last 10 minutes of the session. It's 3.30 to, um, oh, is the, the microphone's not, not connected. Okay. Yeah, we are currently uh, teaching a session of the class, um, and actually, uh, Charles Mirabile is probably doing it right now. I think they might have ended early because they were student presentations, but it's um, 3.30 to 4.45, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, okay, so now on to the discussion. So just a brief kind of intro to um, that, uh, to, to frame the problem. Uh, there are many aspects of this that I think are definitely uh, up in the air and uh, worth, you know, uh, worth discussion, but uh, I'd like to frame this in terms of the documentation problem and uh, the onboarding problem, which are kind of two sides of the same coin. So first of all, in terms of documentation, right, it quickly becomes out of date, like the latest and greatest for Linux kernel documentation in terms of books, right, the one that everyone recommends. And uh, the one that was our starting point for the material that we created was Linux Device Drivers 3rd Edition, which was published in 2005. So, you know, uh, and the material doesn't really meet students where they are. I mean, there's lots of like, there, there's various labs and things. I mean, even, you know, LDD3 at the time, right? I mean, it's on kernel 226 and it's much more of a reference manual. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of good kernel documentation, but, you know, when you've been working in, in the kernel, right? It's easy to, um, it's easy to see all these things, these technical terms and kind of forget, you know, what it's like to see it for the first time uh, and just how, you know, mysterious some of this stuff is. Uh, and it's it's difficult to know just how to even navigate it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's, you know, not the most entertaining content to read, uh, especially if you're new to this stuff. So, you know, there is, there is that aspect. And then in terms of onboarding, right, um, how does an engineer break into kernel development, right? Unless you just randomly accidentally get recruited to a co-op like I did, um, you know, working in the, in the core kernel group, you know, it's extremely difficult to get started on this stuff, right? You need mentors, you need people to show you how to do things, you need people to point you in the right direction. Uh, and if it weren't for me just randomly bumping into Steve Meisner at just some random event, uh, there's a very low chance that I would be working in kernel engineering or even have any idea how it works. So yeah, where do people go to start without guidance? And you know, there are plenty of good resources, right? There are people producing interesting resources. I'm sure they're out there, right? I mean, it's 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 an, a known problem, but how do they actually find the right eyeballs, right? How do you actually get those resources to the students, right, from the opposite direction? So finally, discussion questions, and then we can just kind of open it up, right? How did you guys get into kernel development, right? Anyone who's a kernel engineer here, how could that experience have been better? And how can we, uh, how can our program address that shortfall? So, yeah, I'd like to open it up to discussion. On all the right points. I started out is by myself. I mean, on my own, <laughs> working weekends and holidays and uh, trying to find resources and talking to the community. So um, somebody showing you the resources and providing, saying, hey, talk to, talk with you for a half hour or showing you resources, that's very helpful. Absolutely. So what can you, how could you, I think, I, I mean, I'm kind of an insider to your program, having <laughs> having worked with you. <laughs> yeah, she, she's a plant, you know. <laughs> so, um, I think you reaching out to the developers, going into the universities, I think is is um, a great way to connect with people. I'm doing something different with my um, my mentorship program, where I open it up and then I do get a lot of people, but um, having a uh, credit as a part of the university gives them the time to work on things. So that's that's actually good um, as well. So you they also get uh, help from uh, their support from their university too, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Hi, Joel. Hello. I got uh, started 
like I think a lot of people in here writing a device driver. Mm -hmm. um, there was a need for an, a device driver for a particular PCI card, and I was I lost the you know the card draw, so just had to go in and figure out how it worked. Um, there was nobody at the company where I was at that knew anything about Linux or knew anything more than me about Linux, which you know I'm not saying I knew anything. I knew next to nothing. Um, you know, it, so there was a lot of running into brick walls and, and going down dead ends for me. It took a lot longer. I mean, you know, there's there's people that could have written that driver in three days, and I took three weeks. You know, so uh, it was a very definitely a learning experience for me. Um, could have been better. My experience could have been a lot better, <laughs> um, but uh, at the time, this was back in. 98, I guess. So there wasn't a lot of expertise, or a ton of expertise around. So I would go hit, you know, Usenet and, <laughs> uh, and, and things like that for, for help. Uh, I applaud what you guys are doing because the best way, I think, to get this to happen is to have a community of people that can say, this is how it works. And, and be, somebody be able to post a question and say, well, what does this mean? Uh, and We'll probably have six or seven different answers, and it'll all be various degrees of right. So, uh, you know, but but I think uh, what you guys are doing it's uh, certainly better than anything we've we've got in the past. Um, interesting thing is, you've got uh, at least one member of the audience that's intensely uh, interested in documentation. <laughs> so, uh, you know, might want to. I want to see what John has to say. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> well, let me start, I guess, by apologizing for um, having inflicted such a boring and out-of-date book on the world. No, I mean, it's it's the best. It's the best that we we found, you know. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> you know, we've been, uh, you know, we started. We used it as a starting point, right, to kind of frame our material. And so, I mean, we we definitely couldn't have done it without, you know, without that starting point. I am joking with you, right? <laughs> I actually, I mean, I have a question because you talk a lot about the documentation problem. Um, have you thought about working with the actual in-kernel documentation and helping us to improve that and to make it better so that we can help bring people into the community? Because that's, is in fact a particular focus of mine. I would like to have some help there. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great idea. I mean, I'd love to, you know, connect our program more with you know, the actual people maintaining the documentation. So we, we should definitely talk more. Let's definitely do, because there's, I mean, we're, we're not the only source of documentation at the kernel, actually, in the kernel, but and I don't think we'll be hosting video lessons anytime soon in there, but, um, which I think is a great thing to do, by the way. Um, but I, I would definitely appreciate any help that I could get in, in making it more welcoming to people that we're trying to bring in the community. Yeah, no, oh, no, sure. John, I didn't want to put you on the spot, okay. <laughs> but I do think that the documentation is an order of magnitude better than it was just you know five or ten years ago. It was it was just a bunch of notes scribbled together ten some odd years ago, and now we actually have some coherency to it, and it's pretty dang up to date. Uh, I mean, I know it, some of it lags, but I, one of the reasons I actually did this was because I think. You guys need to talk to him and you know maybe you say uh, let's get some getting started guides out there to say where do you look what do you work on yeah i mean that's that's basically the kind of material we're trying to create i mean because so a lot of the documentation is very good if you're already a kernel engineer right if you know where to look uh but if you don't know where to look right that's that's where the problem is right if you don't know what you know what a lot of the terms mean i mean i don't know if there's like a centralized like glossary, but right. I think definitely when I was starting out, it's it's, <laughs> it's it's difficult to know. You know, when you have all these acronyms, like they're they're they can be quite difficult to Google, right? Because they usually end up being something like if they if they even if they are Linux related, they're probably not kernel related. You guys, uh, whoa, sorry about that. Have you guys um, kind of sat down and had a think about? what um, like information pieces are missing. Like to me, part, part of the challenge with communi communicating such a 
huge wealth of information is that you can't, you, like you, you have to have like a hierarchy of, of detail, right? Like you can't read the entire source code, which is why we have documentation and you can't read the entire documentation, which is why you have like getting started guides. And like, I mean, as a starting point, you can't say, I'm gonna read the entire Linux kernel and understand how it works. Like that's why we have abstraction. So have you guys had a thought about like what more abstract pieces of documentation would be helpful? Or I don't know if that's part of what the discussion is trying to identify. So actually, that's a perfect question. I, you know, I'm surprised I didn't plan you in the audience to ask that uh, because that's that's one of the things I wanted to focus on, right? Is uh, like how do we structure a content, right? And so um, it's a perfect chance to kind of pull up what we have right now. Uh, so this is sort of the way that we're presenting the stuff right now uh, is so we we have this class session, right? And then you know one of us takes frantically takes notes on what's going on. And then we try to generate more useful content from uh, from the class material. So we've kind of moved away from doing a lot of the kind of like lecture style stuff, right? So originally we generated slides um, from you know from the uh, LDD3 stuff, and a lot of that still still remains. Um, we've made some changes since then, but let's say like writing character drivers, right? Um, here, I think the uh, kind of this thing isn't scrolling, but uh, let's see. It's not letting me scroll. Oh, there we go, right? So major and minor numbers, allocating, deallocating, dynamic allocation, right? And so this basically comes right from from, um, from the book originally, um, especially the character drivers content. Uh, so we decided to kind of structure the course around preparing people to write like character drivers um, and kind of the whole process around that, uh, you know, writing uh, system calls, things like that. So we started out, you know, kind of doing lectures on slides, and then recently we've been moving towards more of a flipped classroom type of thing, where we have kind of pre-recorded stuff for people to watch, uh, because you know you can't really, for a number of reasons, you can't just publish your course lectures publicly, right? Um, and so we've moved towards having more like live coding type of content in class, uh, which kind of puts pressure on us to come up with stuff, you know, new examples each class. And so this semester, and this is somewhat new, we've actually been trying to publish like lecture notes. Um, so here's some examples like, uh, right, we have kind of, we use the marquee tag. Um, so this is that was sort of a policy thing, right? But, you know, we talk about kind of, we have like an outline of what we did, and then we talk about some assignment stuff at the beginning. And then, you know, we're covering things like, Right, C compilation, right? How a C program becomes an executable, right? The four steps of compilation, which is something that's not really covered much, if at all, um, in a lot of uh, university curriculums. Uh, so we have a bit on syscalls, right? How does, when you actually make the syscall, how does that actually get, you know, to the driver, right? How do you actually get there? And so we're, we're organizing it kind of by lecture, right? And we do have some gaps uh, we're a little bit behind for uh, various reasons, but you know we do have some some interesting content on here, and we're yeah. I mean, one of the things we'd like to ask is, you know, how can we better structure this, right? I don't think it makes so much sense to do it entirely chronologically. You know, maybe it makes sense more as more of like a wiki type of thing or more of like a getting started kind of guide, right? Uh, but as we're writing this, we're coming up with ideas on how to restructure the course. You know, when you take a, a let's say. Um, you know, an average like junior to senior level computer science student or or graduate student, right? Who ideally uh, has a pretty good knowledge of C, um, ideally, and um, you know a decent knowledge of computer science in general, and maybe you know just a, a at least a beginner's knowledge of Linux. You know, how do you get them to be able to like work with patch sets, do code review, like work with the open source community, uh, give them the tools they need to kind of work with you know, the Linux, the Linux kernel source tree or just large projects in general, right? You know, so, you know, Cscope and Elixir and, you know, the various tracing tools. You know, some of the earlier stuff is much more uh, kind of basic, but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we have, right now we're doing it in terms of this stuff. Oh, I guess I can also mention we have various assignments that people submit, um, you know, as uh, patch sets, right? We have them do things like, um, you know, trace system calls, build a shell, right, to just kind of um, 
exercise their knowledge of um, of C and of uh, system level programming. And also in building a patch set, right? They have to create a you know a ten to I think like twelve patch patch set, and then submit it to our mailing list uh, as their assignment submission. So kind of working backwards from there, right? Um, here I guess show one more interesting one. It would be um, a kernel compilation, right? They have to compile the kernel. That's one of the first assignments, which is something you know, like once you've done it, you know you 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 know how to do it, but it's it's more of just you know follow these instructions. Uh, but something that not a lot of um, computer science students end up doing um, these days. I think it used to be more more common. So yeah, from there, um, getting back to the question, right? I mean, we're kind of we're using the semester as kind of the uh, uh, and the and you know the 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 need to actually deliver this course as kind of pressure on us to generate this content and like figure out how to structure it to get people into it. So. Yeah, I mean, does anyone have any ideas on how this content could be better structured for a student? Ask the students about. Uh, yeah, we try to. You know, I mean, usually they're pretty busy with, you know, like you know, we we're, they're asking questions about the assignments and the, the specific topics, and then we say, hey, you know, what do you think about the overall design of the course? Do you want to contribute to the course? You know, here's right. We show them. We provided. Um, kind of guidelines on how to write our, our entire website is um, an open source project. Our infrastructure is open source. So go to slash E. No, actually, wait a minute. It's right. It's right there. Each page actually has the, um, the uh, source, the link to the source right here. Uh, this, I mean, these are the, this is the infrastructure stuff, which I'm just going to skip over because there's a lot of development going on. Um, but this is all like the, the website, which contains all of the course content, is an open source project. And we invite students to contribute um, as much as uh, they can. You know, we have there's a system for giving for student feedback in the course, which students are invited to do. But, you know, uh, only a limited number actually fill out the form. I just want to clarify my statement because I felt like it came across as a little mean. But <laughs> what, I, what I mean is that often the people who are trying to do the learning have the best feedback on what they're struggling with. And like students are one example of the population that would be learning these things, but like maybe even having, I don't know, a website or a way to collect or solicit struggles from folks who are learning how to do various kernel things just in the community would be a way to collect information or feedback about this that would probably be more accurate than coming from people who already know how to do these things. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's very difficult to explain something if you already know how to do it in a way that would be under like understandable for someone who doesn't know how to do it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So you had a slide earlier where you were talking about you know, people's path into, uh, into kernel development. Mine's a little non-standard, so it probably isn't relevant here. But one of the things that I found that, uh, you know, both for myself and for uh, people that I've mentored in the past, too, is that helps is to have a real bug to fix or a real problem to fix. You know, when you have a... a, a you know, there's plenty of bugs out there, right? You know, and, if, and having a, uh, you know, to, to, you know, if you can get someone to uh, take that bug from you know, start to finish and sending patches and stuff like that, that's a, it's a pretty good incentive, especially when they see that pat their patches get merged. You know, and maybe not something that is um, relevant for an intro to, to kernel development class, but maybe more of a continuing engagement kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, we try to provide opportunities for people to kind of continue with what they're doing. I mean, before, you know, it was mainly trying to recruit people to internships, but for various reasons, that's not as easy as it uh, as it used to be. Um, but we'd like to provide more opportunities for people to participate. Um, and so, yeah, finding a good way to kind of track those types of beginner level issues uh, or just, I mean, I don't know if there is a location that's like the standard place where these things are tracked. But, um, you know, it's a <laughs> right. That's another part of the onboarding problem, I think. Right. So. Uh, I 
to your question. Some of the things that, that you talked about and that I read as the screen was passing by is, mm -hmm. is it, it sounds like you do a lot of education on how to engage with the community and how to, and what that process actually looks like and how to, how to communicate with, with, with those folks. I mean, it's a different kind of communication, right? When you're talking to people who work in the kernel about the kernel and, uh, for me, I, I, I was never a deep kernel developer like most of the people in this room, but I was an embedded software engineer. And so a lot of times we had hardware where we had to tweak drivers to make them work for specific hardware applications and things like that. And I had no idea how to engage with the community. I, I could consume things that were coming out and, and things. So I, I, I just I wanted to say that I really like what I'm seeing here, that you're teaching them more than just how to build something for the kernel, you're really teaching them about the ecosystem and the community and, and how to engage and move these things forward because I think that's that's very important. Uh, in fact, in some ways, probably more important than than the actual know-how on how to do the thing is how to get the thing done. So anyway, that's, that's all I was gonna say. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just to, to add to that, yeah, I mean, because one, one of the issues and one of the concerns that people have, have um, you know, have told us is, hey, you know, kernel development, that's great and all. There's not that many kernel development jobs. Not that many people are actually going to get into kernel development. But uh, we tried to make the skills that, you know, we teach, at least especially the intro course, you know, as general as possible for just getting people into kind of the, like the open source uh, mindset, right? I mean, there's two meanings to the word Linux. I mean, ignore the, you know, GNU whatever joke. But, right, there's the Linux kernel itself, right? And then there's the Linux community and ecosystem of open source projects, that all sorts of different communities and organizations, you know, bundle together uh, to give people the, uh, the, you know, the user experience or developer experience that they, that, you know, that they've come to enjoy. So, yes, this is actually a really interesting presentation to me because I got into kernel development like two months ago, so I don't have as much nice. bias, and uh, I just graduated university as well. So, congratulations! I'd be, the, I'd be the kind of the target audience maybe a year after when I was the target. Um, <laughs> And I was thinking during this presentation, like, would I take this course? Like, is this a course I would have taken? And for context, I got into kernel development based on a chat GPT query, uh, which is probably I'm the only person to kind of recent, you know. Um, but I, I literally asked chat GPT, I was like, I want to build this thing. How do I do it? And it was like, oh, well, you're going to need to write a device driver. And I was like, okay, well, how do I do that? And it was like, oh, well, you know, you need to figure out how Linux kernel works a little bit. And then, you know, that directed me um, and that sort of pointed me in the direction of what I needed to do. I think my concerns with this course um, as a student would be that uh, I wouldn't know how applicable it is outside of Linux kernel development uh, in the sense of there's a lot of patches and, you know, there's a mailing list, but from an outsider's perspective, that's quite unique to, you know, the Linux kernel's development. Um, a lot of students, at least at my university, actually didn't even know how to use Git very well. Uh, so kind of throwing them this curveball with all these Git patches and a mailing list, I think is quite a tall ask. Uh, and it would probably be better just to start with like, okay, we're just going to teach you the basics of Git. And then from there, you can build off of that. Um, so I think, I mean, no, that's a good point. Um, but I think, um, I think if you haven't worked with some of the patch set stuff and, um, you know, you're, you're, you're unfamiliar with Git, it's, it's actually... And I think people overestimate the difficulty of working with with patch sets, right? I mean, Git was designed, you know, for the Linux kernel community, right? I mean, it was designed kind of with this in mind. Um, and I think uh, so far we've had a lot of success with people learning how to use Git and working with patch sets. And, you know, when we start by by teaching that stuff, by getting them started with this stuff, making, you know, they send, you know, one patch, right? And then we we... And of force them to engage in this like advanced usage of Git, uh, which ideally will also get them comfortable enough where like the more basic usage that they, they would be asked to do at um, you know at some other company or some other position would just be would be a walk in the park for them, right? And so they would just have that advantage going into um, into other internships or other jobs, you know, and th that would help them stand out as somebody who knows how to contribute to open source, right? It's kind of you know the sort of karate kid like wax on wax off type of thing. Right, where they, you know, we make them use it in this way that, you know, it could be useful if you go into the Linux kernel community if you're contributing in that way. But uh, it's going to be especially useful just to have that that knowledge, you know, trained into yourself, um, just just in your software engineering career in general. I wanted to expand on that a little bit. Uh, I've been doing this since 1985, and everything you're seeing here 
as a direct analog of any other system I've worked in. Every system has a print K alternative, some way to get data out to the console. They deal with interrupts. Uh, subsystems that talk about talking to files, talking to network, you know. So, <coughs> yes, it's, it's specific to Linux because that's how you're going to learn how to do it immediately. But don't think that everybody's got to have a, a function called print K. You know, you might go to work for <coughs> in Windows and, uh, you know, write an Indus device driver. There's going to be different things that you use to get data out to the console. But the concept's exactly the same. So, you know, I think uh, everything that they're doing here, while it is Linux specific, is general enough that you can relate it to any other system level, whether it's RTOS or, you know, Mac OS, which is uh, what a, uh, yeah, John's over there going, yeah, hey, Mac OS. Um, it's, uh, you know, that's just a mock kernel with a BSD personality on top of it. And it's, uh, you know, it's all, it's all relative. So don't, don't take it as in, this is the way it's got to be everywhere. You got to generalize the concept. So, and I think they're doing a good job. Just like we have now. I got it. Okay. Uh, next and then, go ahead. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I guess to, to answer both the question of like, how to make the course better, but well, so I, I guess there's kind of two things there. Um, so the, have you talked to the LK camp people? The who? LK camp. No. Um, so it was like this student group at the University of Brazil, and mm -hmm. and uh, they were uh, th th they basically put together the series of like like the, the, this hacking group so they could teach themselves how to work uh, on a Linux kernel. Um, and yeah, anyway, uh, most of them I think have graduated now. They're still trying to keep it going at at their school. Um, but I imagine they might have some feedback on this, but it also got me thinking about this is structured as a course, which is great. Um, I think it would be awesome. Like I, I would have liked to take a class like this when I was in school, but, um, I think that that is also kind of dependent on your school being able to teach the class. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess you, yeah, you could take this online, but it might also be nice to try to put something like this together that's oriented towards a student group. So they're not dependent on the university to host this course. So wait, um, are, are you uh, are you an audience plant as well? Because yeah. that's, that's, yeah, one of the exact things I wanted to discuss, right? How do we make this, how do we, um, you know, make this more accessible outside of the, you know, university course format? Because it is somewhat restrictive, right? Yeah. We need to fit it in these 12 weeks and you have to be, you know, paying money to a certain institution and, you know, this and that and the other thing. Uh, but right, there's deadlines that are enforced by somebody who isn't us that we can't control, right? Uh, you know, various regulations, et cetera. Um, and so we would, you know, we've had interest kind of internally within Red Hat and then just, you know, I've just random friends, random software engineers uh, who are just interested in, in this content. And uh, we'd like to know, you know, how can we make this more asynchronous? How could we break it up into like more bite-sized chunks, maybe smaller workshop sessions? Um, yeah, and that's that's something we'd like feedback on. So oh, what Brandon said, boot camp. That's what Brazil did. And there are a couple of people that came out of the boot camp here in the uh, conference. I can introduce you to them. Um, they have done that. They had um, they would run boot camps um, outside of. It's almost like a, a elective or a uh, group, like mm. in the in the university, and they would just run them, and they would have. Um, Brian I think you participated, and then I participated once or twice. They would uh, come and ask us, ask the maintainers uh, to provide content. Um, for for what you are doing, you're you are tied to a university. That is true. Yeah. So going back to your question about bugs, and somebody commented about bugs. Yeah. So that's what I am doing. I'm running a Linux kernel bug fixing mentorship. So um, I I do I use various resources and then I almost run them like a college course um, with the office hours and everything I set up I meet them once a week all my mentees so I ask them to fix bugs and they do I have uh, to graduate I have uh, they have to commit like five to ten patches 
to the kernel, varying anywhere from starting with documentation patches to uh, testing patches to fixing warnings. I tell them where to find bugs. So my goal is to get them ready, get them, uh, teach them skills to be participate in open source, also be able to generate their own work, meaning be able to just go find things. So um, that's kind of what I am doing. One thing you could try is my, knowing, I know your program well enough, so, but well, well to be able to comment, I think. So if you ever want to just uh, do experiment with them, you can still go to the un people where you, um, students are, but run as boot camps or summer mm -hmm. camps or something like that. That could be interesting. So, So one, one idea you might be able to do too is I'll probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago, there was, I don't know how to pronounce it. There was the kernel had the, I must spell it, E-U-D-Y-P-T-U-L-L-F. How do you, how do you say oh, it? Oh yeah, I've heard. Uh, it had so, that chat, but for, you know, to yeah. get people on board, but I'm sure it was probably a pain to, for the people running it to like check. I've heard it's a, just a gigantic bash script. So. But I was wondering, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, if you have students and interns and everything else that maybe like, you know, with like machine learning, you might go to re like revisit something similar to like that, to where you could get it automated to where you could have people do patch postings and, and it would be less, it'd be more, uh, yeah, less hands off. So are you an audience plant as well? Yeah. <laughs> Cause this is exactly something we're working on. We're working on creating kind of open source infrastructure to do exactly this. Um, so for example, the, uh, let's see the let's switch to this tab. So uh, the P0 build the shell assignment, right? One of our goals was to uh, be able to like take this thing and then, you know, apply each patch and like test the functionality, uh, you know, within some VM or, you know, in our backend. Um, we didn't quite get there because we had to learn how to do web development and like do this over the summer and and, and various things. But we do have a whole uh, uh, initiative and project to do this, which actually runs on the same uh, system. I mean, it's tested for Fedora 38, or I guess should be 39 now, um, and which is the same system that we have the students work on, right? So the students are being uh, could you know they they have to set up an environment that will also allow them to contribute to the open source project that is also the course infrastructure. That's in development. I mean, right now we have some like custom uh, email, like custom popped and SMTP servers, authentication system, matrix server, things like that. You know, Seagit, right? I mean, here's, uh, you know, this this CSS took me way longer than I want to admit, but there it is. Um, and so, yeah, that is something that we're working on. And so we'd like to be able to, um, you know, to automate some of the some of the grading, basically, right? And just open that up to, for people to just do whenever. Um, but it's. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a more difficult problem than um, we thought it would be. But it would be interesting to try and apply some kind of AI technique to that. I mean, I don't, I haven't worked with AI, but you know, if anyone does AI and wants to help out, that's something we could be interested in. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has interns who they want to volunteer for this project, let me know. <laughs> And one is sort of giving them the motivation to, to want to, to work on the Linux kernel specifically as a project. And certainly finding projects for people to work on that are real, you know, upstream projects, because there is definitely a difference between people sort of just sending patches to a, you know, a class group to be graded and, you know, sending actual patches upstream. And you know, we've heard from a lot of people how, here how they've started. And it's basically always either there was a bug they had they really wanted fixed or a, you know something they really wanted to, to get working so they knew exactly what thing they wanted to work on or they joined a company that was doing kernel stuff and they were told here's an exact project you're going to work on so i think certainly whether it's survivorship bias or not you know a lot of a lot of people who work on the kernel have started with a specific project they're trying to do um, and the second thing that is important is, yeah, reducing that, that friction of how do you actually start doing it. A lot of people have mentioned getting started guides as something to aspire to and use. Uh, on the K-Unit 
um, framework. We have a getting started guide in the documentation and we have heard lots of good things from people who are getting started in kernel development via that um, as a, you know, that there are two kinds of documentation, the reference documentation, the more tutorialized stuff that takes you step by step. And if the kernel can have more, you know, we've, we've got pretty good reference documentation for a lot of things, having those getting started, here's, you know, step one, you know, compile the kernel, follow these steps. Step two, you know, write a file that says hello world, a kernel module that says hello world. If we can integrate that into to kernel documentation more, I think that would help. Um, and things like, you know, on the KUnit side, we have tooling that lets you build and run a kernel in one command um, mm -hmm. with a test. And that lets people skip over the hard bits of doing that the first time so they can, you know, see that they can do something before they can then go back and learn exactly step by step how it worked um, and split that up after they've already had the, you know, joy of seeing something work. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of the the goal. That's it. So that makes me think, kind of the, the like the hierarchy of things could kind of be, you know, there's a more narrow getting started guide at the beginning with the patches and this and that, and it can kind of branch off into these more specific areas. The goal is eventually to get people able to just work with the reference documentation and just kind of split out into those different areas. Yeah, I think you know, looking at the. Uh the course you've got there, the, the one thing I see is, you know, this is a kernel development course and it looks like you don't, you know, write any actual kernel code until relatively late because you're doing all of the groundwork. Um, and maybe it would be nice to have, you know, day one, here's a super quick, you've built and run a kernel. You might not understand exactly all of the steps, but, um, you know, you've seen where you're going before you then learn how to fill in all of the the steps on the path. Yeah, there are week two, we have them compile the kernel and then um, send us a little thing about it. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we tried to just throw people into writing character drivers much earlier on in the past and that just was not really as successful slash like they didn't really get everything that was going on. Uh, but I think, I mean, kind of what we lead up to at the end here, uh, these, I mean, I'm not, we, these need some work, so I'm not necessarily gonna show them, but the idea is uh, we have them write a specification for some kind of interesting character driver and then uh, that's part one. Part two is they actually swap with each other and they implement somebody else's character driver. And then they do their final presentation on that one. And so that has been interesting. <laughs> I... mm -hmm. So be before I'm done, I do wanna give some thank yous because I see there's one minute. I don't know how hard the stop is at this point, but um, so. Yeah, so just a big thank you to Heidi Dempsey for being a longtime supporter of this program. Um, you know, she is in the uh, Red Hat Research Group. She runs the research. She's the Research and Innovation Director in North America. You saw her in the video. Um, and she was supporting us from the beginning. And, you know, but she's the reason that we, you know, had interns to begin with. Uh, then Mike McGrath, who's the VP of Core Platforms at Red Hat. And he's our executive sponsor. And, you know, it's because of him that we're able to spend some, you know, some time at my, you know, some of, some of us at the team, we can spend our actual work time, uh, you know, not too much, right, on uh, this project. And of course, thank you to the open source community infrastructure team, which has one of the most confusing names, right, because it's the same as operating system continuous integration. So for a long time, I thought they were the same thing, uh, but they provide hosting for open source projects. And so they've given us some hosting. And then here's a much longer list of people. So I'll just say each name because this will take a while. Charles Mirabile, Julia Denham, Michael Burke, Connor Kalman, uh, Dennis Alexandrov, Jake Carenthi, Joel Slobodnik, Daniel Bauman, Musegwa Guma, Steve Meisner, William Maloney, Jeff Brown, Val Cohen, Ian Chen, Holly Yanko, Fred Martin, Perry Myers, and Peter Marticelli. This is probably an incomplete list, but I made it this morning. And finally, thank you. Visit our website, and there's my website at the bottom.